The delicate dance of monetary policy, the fragility of the regional banking sector. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romaine Bostic. It's good to be back, by the way. Welcome back. Houston was really fun, but not as fun as here. So mm-hmm. t- take that in stride. All right, let's get to the market here. S&P uh, up just barely here, up four-tenths of 1%. I got to say, Jay Powell didn't really do much to move the market. You are getting a little bit of a bid into the bond market on the long end. You got yields down uh, by about four basis points on the 10-year. But I don't want to call it a nothing burger because it was a something burger, but it wasn't a really tasty burger. Let's put it that way. Uh, gold, though, however, making no bones about it, continuing to grind higher, over $2,100, and that really does dovetails with Bitcoin's also high, and that's confusing. So is it actually uh, a a risk on uh, feel? And the dollar just a little bit weaker, down three-tenths of 1%, the weaker currency in all the G10 space. But meh, I would say Powell, meh, what do you think? Uh, Alex Seal is back and, of course, looking at gift horse in the mouth once again. Alex, just got to take the rally for what it is. Maybe another potential record high. Not quite on the NASDAQ, which is trying to claw back those losses from that two-day sell-off, but a big bounce off that 20-day moving average, which is a somewhat encouraging sign that, yes, Alex Steele, there is still life left in this rally (laughs) after all. But Bloomberg strategist Ven Ram, he says, beware of false profits. The size and scope of the rally has already exceeded several key historical benchmarks that would indicate a reversal might be near. Now, he points out that when you look at the aggregate market capitalization of the Nasdaq composite last week, that briefly surpassed the $27.5 trillion size of the U.S. economy in total. That's the highest ever valuation investors have ever assigned the tech uh, sector outside of that pandemic-induced rebound. And while the setup into equity markets may still seem, well, a bit far from the bubblish territory that people are concerned about, the macro outlook may not be supportive of additional gains. That's according to UBS strategists. Their call right now is largely around concerns about weakening productivity worldwide, a pattern, if you remember, that spelled the end of the bull run back in the 1990s. Now, those strategists also say when you look at real disposable income growth, that is weak and it will get weaker. Variables that need to start looking up for that bull run to persist. We're going to get back to that story in a second, but we got to start off with the big story of the moment, and that is the drama surrounding the regional banks and New York Community Bank Corp, and really the lagged effects of last year's regional banking crisis. A 70-plus percent drop in the shares of New York Community Bank Corp over the last five weeks alone. That drop apparently paused right now after a fund run by former Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, Alex, rides in with a fresh injection of capital. Yeah, you have to wonder, is this like a private bailout, in essence, at the end of the day, or a private takeover with like a little smidge left for regular shareholders? This chart just is says it all, right? So here is last year, and here is the turmoil uh, in late January uh, that moved down in the stock. And this over here, this little, little tick higher here, doesn't really show the drama that has encapsulated the stock. It's now trading just above $3. It was halted for trading just about about half an hour ago. It's whipping all over the place. Now it's trading at relatively flat levels. I guess the question is here, are we done? Are we there yet? Are there more shoes to drop? Um, And then also trying to find out the why behind this. Is it really just about a rent-controlled issue uh, for for, uh, for, uh, your community bank, or Mm. is it the regulation that's the problem and kind of assessing that out as we go forward, Romain? All right, well, let's get some insights out of Herman Chan, a senior U.S. regional bank analyst over at Bloomberg Intelligence. And I'll pick up on her last question there, Herman, because we talk about the regulatory drama, but some of this might have sort of been inadvertently self-inflicted. Remember, they bought up some of those signatures bank assets right. last year during the regional banking crisis was the purchase of those assets did that kind of lead us to where we are today yeah it's a classic case of be careful what you wish yeah. for they wanted to be in the big leagues uh, really gain some market share within the new york area improve their commercial banking business with the signature assets but it does it flipped them over the hundred billion dollar asset mark which introduced a lot more regulatory scrutiny mm-hmm. and now they're uh, which now ha- has force them to cut their dividend and, and really tank the shares and required an equity injection as we've seen today. So is it over now with the equity injection? It's, it's a lifeline. Uh, I'm not sure we're out of the woods quite yet. Uh, we still don't know in terms of what their deposits have reacted over the past month or so. Uh, they unfortunately didn't give an update on their deposits um, it, with today's release. So this gets to a weird 
question about what the ownership structure is. Right now we're talking about a Steve Mnuchin's Liberty Strategic Capital. They're mm -hmm. putting up about $450 million. Hudson Bay Reverence Capital, about $250 or so, right, a piece right. between the both of them mm -hmm. and then a few extra bucks coming in. That gets us to a $1 billion. Right. Who owns this company now? Right, effectively, it, with the equity injection and also the warrants that, that the, the release noted, it seems to me that the investor group uh, effectively controls the bank at this juncture with existing shareholders massively mm -hmm. diluted. Yeah. So uh, you saw the, uh, the CEO is Joseph Odding, who's part of the investor group. He, he's now leading the charge on mm -hmm. that front. So yeah. uh, it looks like they hold the cards. All right, that'll be interesting. And of course, we should point out, still pending regulatory approval. But given the circumstances, that shouldn't be too hard to come by. Herman Chan, senior U.S. regional bank analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. As Alex was saying, New York Community Bank Corp shares had been halted. They are reopened and now up roughly about 4%, but an incredibly volatile session that saw them down as much as 47% and up as much as 37. Robert Sacken joining us right now, senior global economist over at Citi. And Rob, I do want to get your take here on this because I thought the regional banking crisis was over. What happened? Yeah, this is a great question. Certainly what we're seeing is good news for the market, takes a risk out um, in that regional banking space. But more broadly, I think we're in a very different place um, than we were, let's say, last spring. Last spring, this was a new risk within the regional banking sector. Um, and you saw wild moves in markets as people tried to assess, you know, what would be the spillover to the broader economy and financial stability. I think we saw then it was concentrated in a few banks. Um, and I think we're seeing that now as well, that this issue is really concentrated within New York Bank Corp. And uh, more broadly, you know, we think that the risks within commercial real estate are fairly modest. Uh, when we look at the risk profile, it's really concentrated within office space, mm -hmm. um, a little bit in multifamily. Those office space loans that are riskiest are maybe things that are like in New York City or urban areas. Mm -hmm. Suburban banks uh, loans are holding up much better. Um, and those urban loans are more concentrated in big lenders mm -hmm. who have put aside a fair amount of money to deal with bad loans in the future. So when we look at the risks here, it really seems yeah. pretty modest from an economy-wide perspective. Do you expect with the testimony tomorrow in front of the Senate for Jay Powell to be any different based on that? Like, I can't imagine that certain senators are going to appreciate Mnuchin coming in and in essence scooping, it, scooping up the bank. <laughs> yeah, I, and I think, you know, Powell is going to stick to his script that he's stuck to today, probably avoid getting too much into that issue and really say, Something similar, I think, to what I echoed uh, is that the regional banking stresses look fairly contained. Powell talked about a bit of that recently. Um, and then he'll pivot back to more broader issues on the economy and financial stability risks, um, which don't look large from that sector. And the economy is holding up fairly well. Uh, this may be a dumb question, but why should I believe that it's contained? Not, not so much in the, the sense. I know everyone sort of looks back and they want to look for that sort of uh, Lehman, Bear Stearns kind of contagion moment. I'm not saying we're going to do that. But if we are looking at a regional banking sector that is hobbled, and maybe and even those companies that are so healthy, but maybe don't have the confidence to extend lending. Does that not have an economic impact? Yeah, absolutely. And as you said, I mean, there are a lot of aspects of this space that we don't have great visibility into. So maybe we're just, you know, underestimating the unknown unknowns. Mm -hmm. But I think it's telling that markets have taken it much more in stride in terms of you haven't seen the spillovers mm -hmm. um, to, to, you know, to broader bank stocks or broader equities or, mm -hmm. or the interest rate market when these stresses emerge this time around. And, but to, more to your point, I think the concern is that you're going to see a effect on credit and a continued tightening in lending standards. And we are seeing that. If you look at the Fed Senior Law Office survey, um, you've seen tightening in commercial real estate loans, but also all other types of bank yeah. credit. The economy's held up impressively well despite that tightening, but it is ongoing. I love me the SLUs. They're like one of my favorite indicators. Um, but also you just though, like saying SLU. I do yeah. just like saying SLU. <laughs> it's a good term, yeah. Okay, you kind of added me on that one. Um, but. It's interesting because it does feel like, and, and there was a great article in The Economist uh, a long time ago about this, that regulation begets the crisis. So you have a regulation that's solving for a crisis, and then that regulation causes a problem. And to you know, Romain's point, the big tipping point was when they scooped up assets and got over that threshold. Do you think there's going to be a lot of pushback in terms of the regulatory framework? And is that a good or bad thing? Yeah, it's a great question. I think you saw some of that just more broadly from Chair Powell today in his testimony, that they are rethinking uh, some of the banking regulations that, that, that have been proposed. Now, that's more to do with the amount of capital that they expect larger banks to hold. But I do think there is a broader rethink about um, some, of these, some of these thresholds and some of mm -hmm. these capital requirements. And we've seen a lot of stress and movements within the banking sector in this cycle. And I think that's going to feed into how policymakers are thinking about this 
um, for years to come as they formulate kind of new banking policy. This is why we definitely like taking Elizabeth Warren on the Senate Banking Committee uh, when she talks to Powell. All right. Hey, Robert, thanks a lot. Robert Sockin, uh, Senior Global Economist over at Citi. We really appreciate uh, your time today. But I think it does raise the question, like if you just look at what happened to, say, Signature SVB, right, the economy did really well after that. Yeah. So maybe the stocks tanked, maybe sentiment wasn't great, but the economy held up, spending held up, incomes held up. Yeah, it did. And we definitely did not get that worst case scenario, that contagion issue. But it, it raises a broader question, though, as to did regulators do enough to really sort of shore up the regional banking system? Because that was always the takeaway, right? It was kind of mission accomplished. Fed did what they needed to do. Uh, OCC did what they needed to do. And here we are a year later, basically on the one year anniversary in a few days of the SVB collapse. And we're talking about another bank that needs to be effectively bailed out. Right. But the regulation was what tipped them over in the first place. Yeah. Like if they hadn't lowered the bar for right. uh, capital requirements, maybe okay. it would have been okay. The rent control properties would still have been bad, but we knew those laws changed back in 2019. Well, why don't you think the government gave them a little bit more of a leash, though? I mean, knowing that they took on a burden that a lot of other people didn't want to take know. on. And, and I just kind of makes you wonder what was going on behind the scenes that they let them twist in the wind like this. I don't know. I mean, you, you see JP Morgan, like they were able to be like, yeah, we'll give you that sweetheart deal because we really need you to bail me out here uh, for assets from SVB, for example. But yeah, maybe not for, but maybe they would have. I don't yeah. know. Like maybe they would have jumped in if, if uh, Mnuchin yeah. hadn't gotten together. And it'll be interesting too about the ownership structure. I mean, the share is now reopening yeah. after being halted once again, now up 10% at three and a half bucks here uh, on a day where it looked like they were headed to, well, they were below two bucks <laughs> yeah. and a lot more. All right, we're going to continue this conversation and so much more. We want to get down to Washington, D.C. right now, where our Balance of Power co-hosts are standing by with the chair of the SEC, Gary Gensler. Greetings to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. I'm Joe Matthew alongside Kaylee Lines in Washington, D.C., and a pleasure uh, to welcome the chair of the Securities and Exchange Commission, Gary Gensler. Welcome back to our Washington Bureau here at Bloomberg. It's good to see you today. Great to be with both of you. We're looking forward to a conversation today about the climate disclosure regulations that you're unveiling. I have to ask you first about uh, New York Bank Corp with some of the drama that we've seen over this past week and missed filing concerns about uh, commercial real estate fallout. Are you monitoring this? Is there anything you can do to protect investors here? Um, well, I think your viewers would understand that I'm in the role I'm in, I'm not going to comment on any one uh, registrant or filer, but many banks are public companies. Mm -hmm. Those banks need to make sure that they make f full, fair, and truthful disclosures to the public so that the public can make their investment decisions. I know we're going to be talking about climate, but it, mm -hmm. tur it turns out it's connected. They need to make those disclosures uh, that investors take you know, investment decisions on and make sure they have proper controls to make those disclosures. And uh, uh, but I don't have anything more on this one mm -hmm. bank. But just broadly, you're not concerned about systemic risk that might be emanating from commercial real estate. Uh, I, again, I'm not going to comment on one bank and sure. so forth, but broadly speaking, in, broadly at the SEC, we are always monitoring markets for systemic risk. And the reason is, is because investors get harmed when one bank or one non-bank, it could be a bank, it could be a hedge fund mm. that fails and spills out into the market. Uh, I've been kind of, it's ain't my first rodeo. I was even in the Clinton administration when long-term capital management failed. I was in the Obama administration when we were, you know, cleaning up after the OA crisis. And it's always the American public both investors and issuers that get hurt. So at the SEC, we do monitor for systemic risk in our remit, and then we work with Secretary Yellen and Chair Powell and share our thoughts. So to return to this question of disclosures, and this gets us to the news out of the SEC today, you have adopted now climate disclosure rules that have been significantly watered down from what was initially proposed. Scope three has been uh, removed for scope one and two. Companies are essentially going to have to decide whether these climate risks are material to them. It's a pretty significant change. Why not repropose it by just adopting it today rather than opening it back up for comment? Have you opened the SEC up to more scrutiny and potentially more litigation that could come from this? Well, let's just step back for your viewers just for a moment. What we have here is that today, literally hundreds, maybe a thousand companies already today are making information about climate risk available to their investors. They're often doing it on the internet, their sustainability reports and so forth. What we did today is we adopted a rule 
We hadn't had a rule previously. And we said these disclosures need to be in your filings, in your annual reports, in your registration statements, if material. That's consistent with five, seven decades of what we do. Materiality is the benchmark. It's investors get to make the investment decision based upon the material disclosures. In this case, climate risk is something investors want to know about. Hundreds of companies are already making such information available, but this will give it more reliability. Mm-hmm. What's the cost involved here for companies that will be new to these disclosures? Typically, critics point to red tape beyond the politics here. Red tape and increased costs. You actually have a sense of this already for those that are disclosing, and I suspect from the comments that you received, particularly companies that are just making the threshold. I know you have carve-outs for some smaller uh, publicly traded companies, but what would be the additional cost of this due diligence? Could you put a number on it? So, so we, we uh, lay this all out in this release. It's over 800 pages if you want to have some weekend Light reading. reading. Um, but we really based uh, cost estimates on what commenters had given us. And you asked, we got some very, re- we got 24,000 comments on hmm. this. And uh, in terms, it depends on the issuer. If an issuer actually determined that it's not material to their investors, Mm -hmm. the cost would be probably quite low. But if they determine that, for instance, to uh, inform their investors properly that greenhouse gas emissions are material, then the costs go up. But but again, in the release, it, it was measured from a couple hundred thousand per issuer to, I think, upwards to high six figures, but still in the six figure range per issuer. But leaving it up to the issuer to decide whether this is material, could this actually result in less disclosure around climate related risks, not more to avoid incurring some of those compliance costs? Well, what's interesting is if you look at the Russell 1000, the top thousand companies, some surveys show that already 90 percent talk about climate somewhere, climate risk and about 60% put out something about these so-called greenhouse gas emissions. And they're already doing it because investors want to get that information. But again, our history, our remit is about that which is material for investors. And that's, that's what we're doing here. And we're, we're climate risk agnostic. Hmm. And if, if, if more companies make this disclosure or fewer make the disclosure, it's about materiality. But I would say what we did today is important because it will bring some consistency and it's a real rule. Hmm. Kaylee uh, referenced the potential for legal action here. I suspect that you it's part of our democracy. Uh, put some time into this indeed. And, and obviously legal challenges are already being planned. There are nine states being led by West Virginia at this point we've heard about. But I wonder when you consider this and you've been down this road before, is it governments? Is it corporations? Is it environmentalists who will bring the legal challenges to the SEC or it is all, all of them? I, I, again, I think that at the SEC, we endeavor to do things within the law and how the courts interpret the law. And so we take the economics into consideration. We take these 24,000 comments into consideration. And of course, we take in a, another law that's not the securities law called the Administrative Procedures Act, you know, mm-hmm. how we do rule writing. Uh, I feel quite uh, confident that we've done something within the congressional mandate. And why is that? It's because we're a disclosure agency, and that's all we're doing here. Companies already, 1,000-plus companies are already putting out some climate risk information. Investors are already making decisions, and we're saying grounded in materiality, put it in your filings, and be consistent. Sure with what you're doing. On the subject of consistency, though, if you're a big multinational company, the SEC rules are now what they are. California's rules, Europe's rules are significantly stricter. How is this supposed to work if you have to answer to multiple jurisdictions? Kaylee, it's a very good question. They have different um, authorities. We're a securities regulator. Europe passes a law through their European parliament that had a goal to manage the environment. California, similarly, through their legislation. That's not what we do. Mm-hmm. We, we stay within our, 
we stay within our um, chalk lines, if I can use tennis. Uh, Staying within the SEC's chalk lines, despite uh, uh, conversations that you're having today around climate risk, you also, I'm sure, uh, as a five-member commission and as the staff are going to be considering in recent months, because you are uh, facing a deadline coming up in May, around a spot Ethereum ETF. It is, Having approved, it is Kaylee. You had to I get your I do have to ask question this in. question. Of course, we are now about two months into a world in which spot Bitcoin products exist. They have had incredible uh, demand, more than $8 billion in inflows. Now the optimism is Ether spot ETFs are next. Do you not first have to settle the question as to whether Ether is a security or a commodity? Can you answer that first? Well, Kaylee, again, uh, on any one of these crypto tokens, it's about the facts and circumstances as to whether the investing public is anticipating a profit based on the efforts of others. Um, But we do have filings in front of us. I'm not going to comment. I will say this. This is a highly speculative asset class. One could just look at the volatility of Bitcoin in the last few days. And look, I grew up loving roller coasters. (laughs) Maybe in my adult years, I don't ride them as much. But you, you really should be conscious as the investing public that this is a bit of a roller coaster ride on these volatile uh, assets. And then the question is, is how how firm is the foundation of the, you know, you get to the top of that hill, how's the foundation underneath it? And are there cash flows or what's the use case? For thousands of these tokens, there's about 15 or 20,000 of them. They also may be securities because the investing public is relying on the efforts of some group of entrepreneurs in the middle of these projects. And would you consider Ether as part of that group that may be securities? I understand you're asking the question, but again, I'm going to defer on that question. All right. SEC Chairman Gary Gensler, thank you so much, as always, for giving Bloomberg Television and radio your time, and we'll send it back to you. All right. Thanks so much, guys. That was SEC Chair Gary Gensler with Kaylee Lyons uh, and Joe Matthews. So really trying to ask him about those Ether ETFs did not want to bite. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, he laid out his strategy or at least articulated what he thinks is a strategy. I'm not sure that the market interprets it the same way. I mean, I'm not trying to show shade. I mean, it, it is what it is. Yeah. But that's, know? that's what happens when regulation is so far behind. Yeah. The but, but it's been a while. I mean, he came in, you know, looks like he was ready to run through the wall. And, you know, it's been, you know, what, three over almost four years now. Is coming on the four-year mark. Isn't this the, it's not an SEC problem, but isn't this the problem like with AI, too? It's like yeah. it's yeah, well, so it's far prob- ahead of regulation that like, yeah. you need good regulation to move forward, it's, but the it, flip side is going to take so yeah, long. Yeah, the problem isn't with AI. The problem isn't with Ether or Bitcoin. The problem is with Washington. Oh, that feels like a snap. Maybe you can use AI to fix Washington. How about that? <gasps> Rule out inefficiencies and work productivity? <laughs> what would that even look like? All right. Oh, I don't <laughs> know. <we're> <laughs> More than we can handle. <laughs> this is The Close on Bloomberg. One of the top red stories in the terminal today, and it's a doozy. Acne products from several brands like Proactive, Target, and Clinique are alleged to contain elevated levels of benzene. That's a chemical linked to cancer. And this is according uh, to Bloomberg reporting. Uh, and basically, a uh, reporting watchdog area called Valasor. I'm going to pretend like I said that right. So Valasor does all this stuff on, um, on, on consumer goods to make sure they're safe. And they came across this. It's basically when you have ingredients in, in acne cream to sit in hot areas or hot weather for a long time, and I'm talking like really hot shower hot, they liquefy, and that's the ingredient that can cause cancer. Right. So this is like the benzyl peroxide, which in and of itself is safe, but it turns into benzene if you keep it in the trunk of your car in the middle of summer like I do. And also nice, which everyone does. But uh, but which is interesting, too, is that you can also inhale it. So even if you're not putting it on your face, it can come out of the tube and you can inhale it, which is also very dangerous. Oh, is it? Yes. Okay, that I did not know. Uh, This is a serious issue, and I think there's a reason why it's uh, basically the second most read story of the day uh, on the Bloomberg. 
Spielberg. I, I think we all have some connection to this, whether it's in our past life or with our uh, current uh, uh, children and things like that. So it's concerning. I, you know, the first thing I did, like everyone else, is you start going through the, the, uh, the cabinet in the bathroom and looking at the ingredients. Yep. I was yeah. like, what do I give my daughter? Yes yeah. or no? Okay, we're safe. But 100%. Yeah. But, and you look at some of the stocks, though. Um, so Target is not really reacting here. But you have Terra Pharmaceutical. Mm -hmm. You have Estee Lauder. You have yeah. Breckett Bank Benkinser uh, over in Europe. They yeah. closed lower as well. They all have these kind of products. And they close the material lower today. Yeah, and it, gives, it raises the whole question of liability and whether this becomes one of those cases that winds its way through the system for like, you know, a gazillion years. Yeah, pretty much. Good times. All right, well, coming up, it's the past net zero may be paid with carbon offsets. Some think it's a dirty word, some like it, like Tom Montag. My conversation with him next. This is Bloomberg. Just about 3 p.m. here in a rainy New York. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Alex Steele. So some breaking news for you concerning XL Energy uh, and the fire in Texas and the panhandle. So apparently a toppled utility pole that Excel uh, has been told to preserve as potential evidence was inspected and marked with a, quote, do not climb symbol before the start of the fire. We're looking at set of photos that were shared by a landowner whose ranch burned in the blaze that showed a downed pole wrapped in evidence tape sporting uh, a silver inspection tag and a red metal caution tag. And I should point out, Romaine, that stock is down Actually, it's flat right now, but at one point it did hit the lowest level since March of 2020. It does take a long time sometimes to find the cause of a fire, but we saw it with PG&E. We saw it in Hawaiian Electric that yeah. utility poles and unsafe poles that just can't get fixed can be a cause of fire. Yeah, absolutely. And this now opens up the, the litigation phase of this, oh, yeah. or the potential litigation phase of this, even though we still have not determined exactly what the cause was. All right. Well, we're watching that stock as we head into the close. Earlier this week, I did attend BNF's Barrel of Tomorrow Forum in Houston. Now, it was all about energy transition, technology, and innovation. It does dovetail the SEC conversation with the Excel conversation. And in that, I caught up with Rubicon Carbon CEO Tom Montag, and he told me his company aims to be the, quote, the black rock of carbon credits. So basically, if you're a company, you can go to him and buy a suite of carbon credits. And I asked him about the importance of this voluntary carbon offset market. I'll tell you a story that I read in the paper, and I assume it's true because I read it in the paper, <laughs> um, and was about Lego. And Lego had been trying to fix their bricks so they didn't have a carbon footprint. And they did all this work around it, and they couldn't get them right, and they thought they had the right thing. And they tried 200 different types of materials, and they were using recycled, and then they realized the recycling and all that was using actually more carbon than that, and they just were going back to the brick. And here's and I use that analogy because it's a toy company and yep. they make something that kids love and I even use, but they just can't find the way to make it that way. But they're willing to invest the money and the time. And if your journey takes you someplace where it feels impossible to make that, it'd be great if you could offset what you were doing if your insetting process doesn't get you there. And I think most companies would tell you that they don't think their insetting properties get them there eventually. Even today on the panel, mm -hmm. uh, one of the participants said, we feel we're going to need to have offsets in 10 years or something like that. We have plenty to do now, but to really get there, we're going to need offsets to finish the journey. And that's why I think it's so interesting about Rubicon is you have all of it, right? You have the Wall Street investment experience, then you have a trading part, and then there's a scientist part. Having them all together, like that's what you're trying to create like a measurable, liquid, legit, yes. voluntary carbon market. Yes. How hard is that? Hard. Hard. Okay, what's the hardest part? Well, the hard <laughs> part is that there's been so much about it that saying how the wrong, the bad things about it, the bad. It's like saying if, if somebody always was looking at, oh, this stock's bad, that stock's bad, bad, people wouldn't like the stock market so much as opposed to saying, oh, this stock's good, that stock's good, this stock's good. And so there's just been this narrative around a market that, by the way, is confusing because if you look at the name of a project, you don't know what it is. You don't know, you don't know exactly who approved that when, what standards it was under at what time. Does anybody really audit it? And so it is a voluntary market that, doesn't, that hasn't matured yet to the point of a financial market we mature. So it's difficult because people don't want to get caught up in, a, in something that turned out to be not so good. And that brings to like two parts. One is you got to have the supply of the stuff, and then you got to have the buyers of the stuff. Let's go to the buyers first. Yep. Who's buying these carbon offsets today, and how do you expand that? Uh, well, we're trying to expand it. Yep. And we, we, we try to expand it by giving them a diversified portfolio from a credible source, which is us, that owns 
these things with a science team that looks at them and opines on the, the credibility of those. And we also uh, offer a risk adjustment process. So you, we say, listen, all these projects have some leakage or something that doesn't make them be 100, most of them. And so it might be 1%. But it might be a lot, as you'd see in the Guardian article. So the idea, if you want a risk adjustment, we, our science team will risk adjust it. So we believe we're selling you a ton as a ton. So you do Wall Street stuff with we the We do Wall Street stuff. Yeah, it was you one of the first things thing I brought up was like, we should do risk adjustment. It was like kind of securitization. Like and The scientists are like, what? Well, yeah, the scientists said, this is not good. Oh, this project, we don't think it's so good. I go, what do you mean by not good? Mm -hmm. And let's just say, let, let's say they said, oh, I think it's 80% of what they said. I go, oh, because in Wall Street, There'll be a bond that might be it's supposed to be 100. It's at 80, but people are buying it because they think the 80 actually could be 90. Like so, there's still value there. It might not be the 100, but there's value there, and we need to see all the value in these things and support them so they can achieve whatever value they can. And so that's how we came up with the risk adjustment. What kind of companies are buying the credits right now? All, well, you see most of them in the press. You see mostly, well, not a lot. So if you look at it in the market last year. If you look at retirements in America, just the public retirements of offsets, 90% of them were done by 80 companies. Um, in other words, thousands of companies that did small amounts, but real volume was in the United States. And again, this is private. People do retire public, yep. uh, privately and publicly. Privately, we don't really know. Publicly, we do know. And that's like 90 to 100 companies. And you know some of them by just in the press. So it's like oil and gas companies and tech companies, right? I mean, at the end well, of the day, like other, it's, and some service companies. And so, but it's basically high margin companies, right? Yes. That can afford to do that. Yes. How do you get lower margin companies like a chemical company or a refiner or something that needs to do it? Right. But they can't afford it. Right. Well, there you have to find. You try to develop good projects. Okay. That meet their price point. You know, the, the Bloomberg NEF, who's where we are now, does a lot of great research on the emissions of companies and the margins of those companies. And a lot of the big emitters are in very low margin businesses. So they can't afford to do these very expensive carbon removal projects. And so we're trying to work with them and develop projects that they can do that meet their qualifications. And it, it takes some time. That was my interview with Tom Montag, uh, Rubicon Carbon Services uh, CEO. I mean, what's so interesting, not only is like this is the second career for the Wall Street guy, Tom Montag, is voluntary carbon credits, like number one. Yeah. Uh, number two, um, credits are a really dirty word in the industry, no pun intended. There's they a verification are. issue. There's, yeah. uh, there's, can you really trust them? There's lots of different problems, and he's genuinely trying to use Wall Street yeah. to fix that. I, I mean, I'm always really down for any sort of financialization that sort of creates incentives to sort of address mm -hmm. a lot of the social issues like climate change. But it raises the question, are these credits, are they having a meaningful impact? And I think that that's what the science team is desperately trying to do. And I found it interesting because he was like, well, you can take a project, maybe 80% of it's good and 20% is bad. Why throw out the whole thing? Can't we just basically securitize it? Mm -hmm. um, which is something that hasn't been done before within the market. Yeah. And, and again, but again, a lot of companies won't go anywhere near carbon offsets because yeah. of that exact issue. Yeah. And there's no transparency with the price. So getting a price together is very tricky. Oh, gosh, yeah. I remember we were supposed to have that transparency. There was supposed to be a whole market that would be there, and we could all just, just like we look on our Bloomberg terminals and see all the prices, and that never really materialized. I think in theory. And I feel like that was intentional. Like 80 years ago, yeah. I mean, fast forward 80 years ago, you and I won't be here, but someone else will be. Maybe there will be a function on the terminal, but it's very hard to come to a price uh, otherwise. He's very horrified that he yeah, won't be right? angry. Do, do, you, do you know something I don't? Is that awkward? Oh, I'm so wow. sorry. I guess I've been watching, we'll too, be many robots. I've been we'll watching be too many sci-fi movies. I thought <laughs> I could just freeze my head and I could come back and haunt everyone 100 years from now. We'll be <laughs> All right. All right, coming up here, a closer look at the markets, trying to rebound from the big losses of the past two days and a big rebound right now for New York Community Bank Corp. Big swings in that stock for the troubled commercial real estate lender, but a lifeline from Steve Mnuchin, his fund, uh, ponying up about $450 million, leading an effort overall to inject about $1 billion in equity capital. That conversation coming up next. This is The Close on the Bloomberg.
It's the world's second largest economy with a growing influence in global affairs. But geopolitical uncertainties, deflationary pressures, and questions about foreign investment linger. Bloomberg, The China Show, brings you the unmatched expertise you need to keep track of breaking news, in-depth market analysis, and the most influential newsmakers in and around China. Bloomberg, The China Show, now weekdays at 9 a.m. Hong Kong time, right here on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. It's time now for our stock of the hour. And for the third time in less than a week, we are taking a closer look at New York Community Bank Corp. It is not the biggest gainer out there, but it is certainly the most volatile. Right now, up about 3% after multiple halts here on the day. The lesson that we learned today here is, yes, there is a lifeline, and it's going to come in the form of private capital. Abigail Doolittle joining us right now to talk a little bit more about this story. Steve Mnuchin leading a, basically a $1 billion uh, capital injection here for this company. That's moving this stock. Is it having an effect on other regional lenders as well? A huge effect. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, the headlines in terms of New York Community Bank before this headline around the equity raise that they needed equity, that took the KRE or the uh, Community Bank, Regional Bank uh, ETF down sharply. It was down more than 2%. What really stood at that time, out of 140 members Numbers, only four were higher. So we did have at that time mm. NYCB down 45 percent, but a lot of the other stocks were down four or five percent. But as we've been talking about in recent days, because this has been such a story, the true contagion is probably less likely to be material because the 25 biggest regional banks, they don't have so much exposure, exposure to commercial bank. They have a lot of liquidity. The smaller ones, yes, there's going to be some blow up, but it's interesting. I was speaking to a long term veteran yesterday in the regional banking space, and he doesn't think that this is going to be like the SNL crisis. He thinks he doesn't think that there's going to be thousands or even dozens of banks affected. Mm -hmm. He thinks maybe a dozen or so. So relatively, on a fundamental standpoint, it seems more likely to be uh, contained. And yet, from a stock perspective, stocks really reacting to the headlines. Now we have, if we take a look at the KRE, it's actually down ever so slightly. It had moved higher on the Mnuchin headlines, uh, but we do have the bulk of this, and we had the bulk of the stocks after that. The Mnuchin equity raise uh, rescue up. Right now, it's about a uh, little bit more down. Right. I mean, also, run on the bank is different than, like, what they're going through. I get that's the whole deposit, what Ruben Chan was talking about, right? Like, we have to see what their deposit base looks like before yes. you draw any conclusion on that. Yes. Um, now, obviously, the Fed doesn't oversee, like, overall bank regulation, but Powell did comment on bank regulation today. What did we learn about that? Yeah, it's really interesting. So, uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell did comment uh, before Congress uh, in terms of Basel III, the end game, the idea that U.S. banks, the big banks, may need to see more regulation, uh, that they may need to raise capital by about 19% percent or so to bring more in standard with some of the other uh, banks around the world. And that also other tougher regulations will need to be put in place. Now, tomorrow this could come up again. And of course, mm -hmm. uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren could make it uh, pretty exciting as there could be some fireworks because apparently she uh, is very supportive of the, this. There's going to be a period of time for commentary from uh, the public. Uh, but the bottom line is it does seem like the capital requirements for the big banks at some point, we don't know the exact timeline, are going to be raised. But to your point, they do not, the Fed does not regulate regulator Basel III, the regional bank. So a little bit of a separate animal, but it is interesting just to think that, you know, more regulation could be put into place. All right, Abigail, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. I do think that this made tomorrow much more interesting with the Senate Banking Committee uh, and, yeah. and Powell. Usually it's like a snooze fest repeat of the second repeat, day. I do right. not think, and, I think this will make it much more. And today was kind of a snooze fest because we didn't have that news then. But mm -hmm. of course, that's going to be the big topic of conversation. Why wasn't this resolved, Alex Steele? What do you mean? The whole regional banking crisis. I don't know. I'm not in charge. Uh, if I was in charge, obviously it'd be resolved. They told me you were in charge. I mean, was I that's misinformed? Weird. <laughs> I'm misinformed, yeah. All right, coming up, we're going to count you down to the closing bells. Uh, Sarah Hunt, partner and chief market strategist over at Alpine Saxon Woods, will be joining us for her take. This is the close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele and a lot of concern yesterday, Alex, with the market hitting uh, some interesting lows and testing a lot of those uh, key technical levels to the downside. But it looks like 
some of those technical levels maybe provided a little bit of support. I know. Yeah. It's like it's like you, you need a reason to sell, not a reason to buy anymore. I feel like the narrative has kind of switched. You're looking at the S&P up four, five tenths of 1%, a tech, the second best performing sector uh, within that. I do also want to highlight gold and Bitcoin also doing really well. The KBW Bank Index is really not, but uh, well off the lows after the New York Community Bank uh, news came out earlier today. Yeah, a big story here and a week that, well, we were going to see a few catalysts. Of course, you had the big jobs report at the end of the week, a State of the Union speech by the president tomorrow and Jay Powell on Capitol Hill for two straight days of testimony. Day one was today, and he largely stuck to the script, signaling that the strong U.S. economy will keep officials on hold for now. We believe that our policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle. We want to see a little bit more data so that we can become confident and so that we can take that step of beginning to reduce policy rates. The committee does not expect that it will be appropriate to reduce the target range until it has gained greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2%. When we reach that confidence, the expectation is we will do so sometime this year. We can then begin dialing back the restriction on our policy. If the economy evolves broadly as expected, it will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. Jay Powell there in Washington, here in Studio 2 in New York is Sarah Hunt, partner and chief market strategist over at Alpine Saxon Woods to help us count down to the closing bells. And I had to chuckle watching that. I mean, we had the little banner that said Jay Powell speaking earlier. I figured like you could have put any date of his testimony from any of the past testimonies from the last couple of years, and it would have been the same quotes here. A consistent message. Are people finally buying it? Well, I, I think that, you know, the, the one thing you want to do is not say something that everybody goes, oh, my goodness, I can't believe what they just said, right? So this is, this, is an, this is one of those opportunities where you reinforce what's been said and you try to make sure that anything that was off-piste gets back into the fold, right? So I think, that's, I think that was today's. Were you expecting more, not so much out of this particular testimony, but about the communication we're going to get out of the Fed, heading into a meeting that's still, what, a week and a half or so away, uh, with regard to whether they're going to communicate to this market, not just will they cut rates, but give them a better timetable as to when those rate cuts will come? That has been the question all along, yeah. right? Because in the beginning of uh, this year, we had a whole bunch of rate cuts priced into the market. Then they started coming off the table. Then the question is, when are we going to start? Are we going to start in May? Are we going to start in June? And now the question is, are we going to start? If the economic data continues to stay strong, it's going to be hard to say we have to cut rates for any reason. I think the market likes the economic data staying strong. Mm -hmm. And as long as inflation remains at somewhat at least quiescent and doesn't get worse, then I think that you've got a reasonable equity path, you know, X any exogenous variables otherwise. Which was the question I was asking before. Like, I feel like the question now is, like, when do you sell? Like, not when you buy, right? I mean, it, it feels like we're buying the dip, like this is the thing, like we're supportive of equities, like when do you sell equities now? That's a tough question too, because in what's going on right now in the backdrop is you've got the earnings coming through, which is why, which is where I think that you got the first quarter, the, the mm -hmm. last couple of months, the market was acting much better. People expected at the beginning of the year you might see a pullback because what if something didn't go well? The AI story is continuing to play out. People are talking about productivity in the right kind of ways. Most of the things seem to be going pretty well. So there's no real catalyst for that, except that there's a lot of other things. We've got an election coming. There's still problems going on in the Middle East. You could see as oil prices creep back up, that leads mm -hmm. to inflation. That's going to make people concerned because if the Fed can't cut rates at all this year or starts to push that out, I think the market starts to get a little more volatile on the back of that. So I'm looking now at a comp chart on a normalized basis, a NASDAQ 100 and Apple back for the last five years. I don't think we've ever seen this kind of disconnect between NASDAQ 100 and Apple now trading at 169. And I wonder at what point does Apple give tech the signal to sell? Or is Apple an idiosyncratic thing at this point? Is it a China store? Is it totally different now? So I think the reason that, that it can be okay, as it were, that divergence is because you can spin each of the divergences for as a problem of their own making or not their own making of their own industry, right? So for Tesla, it's you've got to slow down in EVs. For Apple, you've got specific issues in China. And there's just always concern around Apple without the next greatest thing, what's going to happen. Meanwhile, they're building more support, more services revenue and everything else, but they're not in any kind of financial trouble. So the stocks that are doing well, which are the ones that are working on that AI framework on the, on the Microsofts and on NVIDIA, those are continuing to do well and the demand is still there. So that allows people to justify saying, okay, it doesn't matter that some of the Magnificent Seven yeah. are not acting as well as they did last year because we have a chunk of them that are.
But what do when you look at the market in aggregate and you look at valuations and I know everyone has their own sort of historical metric that they want to cherry pick to show whether the market's either undervalued or overvalued. But there has been a lot of hay here as to just how much tech stocks now sort of comprise in terms of market cap, sort of rivaling the size of the U.S. economy. And a lot of concerns here that, you know, the lack of growth. Yeah, sure, these companies aren't in trouble, but that growth that everyone got so dependent on, investors got so dependent on, that appears to be, if not gone, certainly waning. In some of the stocks, it is. And I think that that's why you're seeing Apple diverge so much right Mm. now from the NASDAQ. And that's been the big concern on some of the companies where that growth has slowed down, as opposed to others where that growth is either accelerating or you can see a reason why you could imagine it will accelerate in the future. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Apple's made some interesting moves, pulling back from the car and and looking to focus in other ways tells you that they're looking at their own portfolio and saying how are what what is the next place for us to grow so i think people will hang their hats on on growth that could come because they're just such cash generating machines and it's the, it's the companies that don't generate cash that have lofty valuations that are more tricky at yeah. this mm-hmm. point yep. than than anything else but the ones that are generating so much cash it's hard, it's hard not to take that cash generation as, as something that has a value so i'm a dividend guy Mm-hmm. Uh, I make money, but I'm, I'm value, right? That's why I'm a dividend guy. When do you buy me? Well, there's a difference between value, the dividend value trade and the companies that are adding dividends on a growth profile because mm-hmm. I think that that's changed too. Capital allocation has changed. We look a lot of capital allocators. We look at people who are both increasing their dividends and or buying back their stocks. And to the extent that, uh, that you need to grow and have cash flow that allows you to do that, you can't do that in a vacuum. You can't just be stuck at the same dividend level forever because then you're something like a value trap to, to some extent. And right now the market is not value, not, not putting much of a value on that to be you know, cute with my words here. <laughs> but you know what I mean. So I think that there's what you're looking for is somebody who can grow that dividend. Even if the yield isn't fantastic right now, can yeah. I grow it? Am I lo- using my own cash generating yeah. to either buy my stock back or to increase that? All right, Sarah, always weren't great to see you. Sarah Hunt, partner and chief market strategist. At Alpine, Saxon Woods, helping us count down to the closing bells here uh, on this uh, Wednesday afternoon, I believe, Alex Steele, if I got my days uh, uh, correct here. And you missed a pretty big sell-off yesterday. You're back today. Big sell-off? And the market, yes, it was big. Big? It was gigantic. But say it was gigantic. It was enormous. We're now up, so it's still by the dip. (laughs) Even if it's this much or that much, it's still going to be by the dip situation. We're clawing back a fraction of yesterday's (laughs) losses, up about five-tenths of a percent on the S&P 500. Stick with us. Full coverage coming up right now as we take you to the Bell & Beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. We're counting you down to the closing bell. You're here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast. Join now here in our television studio by Scarlett Fu and in our radio booth with Carol Masser and Tim Stenevik as we bring together our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms. Coming off a pretty big sell-off yesterday, Carol, and we're getting a modest rally today. Yeah, a modest rally, bouncing around a little bit. Um, Obviously, to some extent, maybe the market's following a little bit of what we got from Fed Chair Jay Powell, the New York Community uh, Bancorp uh, news uh, as well. But, you know, something that has been solidly in the green for most of the day is the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, still up about 2.4% here with just a few minutes to to go in the Wednesday trade. You mentioned Powell's testimony. That's where I want to go. I think investors are breathing a sigh of relief um, that Jay Powell Powell really stuck down the middle. It wasn't a dove. He wasn't a hawk. I think it was Steve Matthews who said that uh, some Fed chiefs like to refer to themselves as owls, or Fed speakers like to refer to themselves as owls, if we think about it, a, a different type of bird out there. Um, I wanted to call him a turducken, because he kind of covered, you know, he kind of keeps like, down the well, middle. Well, that's a lot of testimony. that he, the, a lot of, he answered a lot of questions. I think so. he wants to be invisible right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's got to get through tomorrow before he does like that. It like he was done by the end. <laughs> I just have to think, like, how much he must hate these things. Uh, he doesn't show job, it, though. He doesn't the, show well, it. Well, yeah, because getting paid, this is part of your job. Maybe it's a job that you like the least. But anyway, <laughs> it was definitely a non-mover uh, when yes. it came to, say, the bond market. You saw some buying on the back end, but that's, you know, pretty much it. It'll be interesting to see day two of his testimony on the Senate uh, tomorrow, particularly in light of the news around New York Community Bank Corp. A lot of questions here about the health of the regional banking sector. As we get the closing bells here on this Wednesday afternoon, a big flip-flop from what we saw yesterday where everything looked dour. 
and a lot of those moving averages were being tested to the downside, a big bounce off of those moving averages for all of the major indices. The Dow Jones Industrial Average up 76 points or two-tenths of a percent. The S&P 500 going to close higher, back above 5,100 or about five-tenths of a percent gain on the day. The Nasdaq back above 16,000 with a gain of about 92 points or six-tenths of a percent. And the Russell 2000, that is your relative laggard, only by a schmidge, but it's up about seven-tenths of a percent or 14 points. I love that you said schmidge. All right, let's go to the S&P 500. 365 names, guys, to the upside here. 135 to the downside and uh, Scarlet 3 unchanged. And the leadership has really changed over the last couple of hours too. Um, tech was the big gainer of the day, uh, still up nine tenths of 1%, but you can see utilities move to the front there uh, up by 1%. It, it's green mainly when you look at the IMAP uh, and that's because the sectors that are in the red are pretty limited. We're talking about consumer discretionary and that's on the back of Tesla and communication services, uh, which is down marginally off uh, two tenths of 1%. All right, guys, let's get to some of the individual gainers. I was really nervous to put this in because uh, I, I thought it was like kind of a sure thing. And then, of course, it was bouncing around and all the volatility. But New York Community Bank Corps, uh, which was at its lows, down 47 percent. It was halted. Then we got the news of this more than $1 billion equity investment, uh, if you will, or, or, or cash infusion, I should say. Uh, and then you also had uh, the stock up as much as 36 percent. Many different halts as the uh, volatility. But the stock uh, shares of New York Community Bank Corps finishing the day up about 7.5 percent here. Here on the day. Uh, do want to also mention CrowdStrike. That was definitely an outperformer, breaking uh, the earnings last night. Uh, at its highs, up almost 23%, finishing the day with a gain of just under 11%. So a top gainer in the NASDAQ 100, hitting a record high. The company reported, as you know, fourth quarter results better than expected, and it did give an optimistic outlook uh, for the current period. I do want to point out several analysts raising their price targets on that name uh, following their results. And then Dexcom wanted to go there. Uh, finishing pretty much near its highs of the day, up just shy of 10% here. Uh, it was a top throughout the day. Uh, I think it's the number one gainer right now in the S&P 500. Also a top gainer in the NASDAQ 100. Heavy volume. FDA giving clearance to its over-the-counter Stello product, making it the first glucose uh, biosensor cleared in the U.S. for use without a prescription. Wall Street cheering the announcement with BTIG coming out saying the clearance came well ahead of their expectations. So again, Dexcom shares up specifically 9 all right, let's go get uh, some of the decliners on the other side of the chart. Uh, taking a look at shares of Apple, finished it down by six tenths of one percent. It did fall slightly, though it was the worst performer on a points basis in the S and P 500, just given its size. Uh, we should note Apple shares falling to uh, levels last seen October 27th. It is down around 14 percent since those December highs. Certainly one to watch there. Also, Brown Foreman, uh, the worst performers on a percentage basis in the S and P 500 today, uh, fell as much as 10.5 percent earlier in the session finishing down by 7.3%. It's the company behind Jack Daniels and other liquors. It lowered its fiscal year projections for organic net sales growth and organic operating income growth, Share, uh, shareholders reacting accordingly. And check out shares of Foot Locker today. Uh, shares falling the most ever after the company pushed yeah, back a plan to expand that. its sales. Yeah, $9.5 billion by two years after a sluggish year last year. Shares finished the day down by 29.35%. The company also predicted adjusted earnings of $1.50 to $1.70 per share for this fiscal year. That did fall short of analyst estimates. And I did want to do a rare fourth decliner here, Alex. Um, Excel Energy, shares of Excel Energy hitting their lowest level since March of 2020, only finished down uh, four tenths of 1%, but they did fall as much as 3.8% earlier in the session. This after Bloomberg News reported after seeing photos that the toppled utility pole that Excel Energy had been asked to preserve as potential evidence was inspected and marked with a do not climb symbol before the start of the worst wildfire in Texas history. This is a stock that I talked about last week because there was a law firm that sent a letter to Excel requesting it hold on to the pole and said that the tag said, uh, mean it had been, meant it had been flagged as needing attention during an inspection earlier this year. Excel shares down uh, about 16% since February 28th. Yeah, it's been a really brutal ride uh, for Excel in relation yeah. to that. Guys, buying on the curve, pretty much. We're looking at, at a bull flattening. Buying everywhere, you have more buying in the back end, though, so yields are a bit lower. Um, about 45 basis points negative is the spread between the two. But, you know, we didn't learn that much from Powell. Said as she goes. I feel like the only thing we did learn is that inflation doesn't have to hit 2%, just the trajectory has to be towards 2%, which we already kind of knew, and we're doubling down on that.
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, here, uh, you know, it's interesting too. We talk about sort of, uh, you know, Jay Powell on Capitol Hill and all the focus right now on economic conditions. Uh, but it's kind of interesting too. I mean, there are a couple big stories out there that I think gives us a little bit more insight uh, into some of those conditions. And one, one stock that you didn't mention, I don't know if it was Carol's job or Tim's job, but you failed, was Vail Resorts here. Mm. Uh, they actually take uh, MTN. But well, maybe I should have left New York Community Bank Corps off my list. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Just saying. I don't know where Brown Foreman. Tim's talking about liquor. You, Tim doesn't drink. What does he know about? I know, but yeah. I did. You know, it's okay. So you're talking about uh, Vail Resorts, ticker MTN, shares finishing the day higher, what, by more than 4% because Scarlet, they're able to charge more for the Epic Pass? Yeah, they're already announcing their 2024 to 2025 season pass pricing. I mean, the 2023 to 2024 season isn't even over yet, but um, the price is up about 8% year over year to $982. Granted, you can go to Beaver Creek, you can go to Whistler, you can go to Hunter, you can go to Mount Snow, but that's some pricing power there. Well, um, yeah, but isn't this just like Wall Street goes to Vail? Right. I mean, it's not like, yeah. yeah, but it's not like everyday it, people are going. We're not going. I will say I, I so I I Carol's heard this a million times, but I lived in Vail when they unveiled the Epic Pass. I spent three years after college there. This thing was revolutionary. Really? I mean, the cost of uh, just a season pass in Vail. This yeah. was back in like, you know, the mid 2000, like early 2000s. OK, um, was over a thousand dollars just for a season pass yeah. in Vail. When this Epic Pass came out and you could go ski at all the Vail Resorts Mountains, which back then was about six or seven. It didn't include all the ones that Scarlett just mentioned. Uh, this was like 600 bucks at the time. I mean, it completely changed the ski industry. You had Altera come out and, and try to, you know, compete with it. There's this, Icon Pass as well. Exactly, yeah. the Icon Pass as well. Um, this completely changed the ski industry, and it also changed the cash flow for these companies, too, because if you buy a ski pass now and the snow isn't good next year, well, then Vail Resorts ends up being the winner. You know, one thing that I should mention is the analysts have noted that the Epic Pass price, price growth is still about 19 percent below the CPI growth since March of 2020. So they could have priced it even more aggressively. OK, fine. But there is some inflation there because people are willing to pay for it. Let's take the other side of it. Shrinkflation. This has been all the talk over the last two days, guys, because Cookie Monster is weighing in on this. <laughs> Cookie Monster tweeted. Wait, is he tweeted, a new Fed member? What? Is he a new Fed member? Do I do Fed members? No, no. He do Just Fed? go, 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 go. Um, <laughs> he says, me hate shrinkflation. Me cookies are getting smaller. Guess me going to have to eat double the cookies. But the whole point is that it's true. It's like- Excuse me, can you say that again, Alex? You do that really well. You are oh, a I, I could, a lot better. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't really committing to that point. But the idea of shrinkflation is you buy the same thing, but they put less stuff in the package because everything's just too expensive. So on the one hand, maybe you go to Vail and pay the pass. On the other hand, your cookies are small. Yeah, that's pretty depressing. No, we've all talked about that. I feel like this has been happening right for some time time. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a bummer. First of all, you do a great cookie monster. No, no, okay. it could have been better. The, it could have been better. Good. I feel it the most with ice cream. No, inflation no, and ice cream? Shrinkflation and ice cream. The one yeah. thing I will say. It's no longer a pint of ice cream? E exactly right, Scarlett. I'm going to like bring it back 12, to the Fed. Ounces. Don't call me boring. But in the beige book, right, businesses found it harder to pass through higher costs to their customers who became increasingly sensitive to price changes. So I do wonder if maybe... I don't know, maybe this is some pushback just against the environment or a sign, or maybe we're pushing back against shrinkflation. Like, People are fed up, Carol. We're fed up and we're not gonna take you it. Want so I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I want cookies. Carol always want cookies. I always want cookies. <laughs> All right, guys, that's a wrap. Our cross-platform radio, TV, YouTube, and of course, Bloomberg Originals. We call it Beyond the Bell. We will see you again, same time, same place tomorrow. All right, stick with us. Our coverage continues right here on Bloomberg Television. A conversation on AI coming up with Salesforce signing a pledge to maximize AI's benefits and mitigate the risk. At least that's how they're pitching it. We're going to have a conversation, well, with the woman behind that, Paula Goldman, Chief Ethical and Humane Use Officer at Salesforce, joining us in just a bit. Stick with us. This is a close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu and a closer look right now at personal finance and financial literacy. 
Earn Your Leisure is a media empire built with the goal of giving rise to undervalued and overlooked voices from the world of business, finance, and entrepreneurship. They want to get people who are generally risk-averse to, well, take a little bit more risk or at least to leap into investing, and that includes a new partnership with schools here in New York, in the Bronx, in Harlem, incorporating financial literacy programs. Pleased to say that the co-founders of Earn Your Leisure join us in studio once again, Rashad Bilal and Troy Millings. It's great to see you both once again here. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for having us. us. Appreciate it. Let's start off with the partnership here uh, in New York with those schools in Harlem and the Bronx. What exactly are you guys going to be doing? So we developed a financial literacy curriculum. And um, we think that it's needed if you think about New York City, the capital of capitalism, but financial literacy is not mandatory in schools. And mm -hmm. the school that we went to, there was no financial literacy 20 years ago, and there's no still financial literacy to this day. So we developed a financial literacy curriculum, um, four different modules, mm -hmm. investing and financial literacy basics, um, entrepreneurship, savings, mm -hmm. investing, yeah. uh, credit. And um, we're working with some schools in New York to yeah. pilot it. I guess we can break that information here yeah, since you said it. Alert. So yeah, we got uh, <laughs> 10, 10 schools in the Bronx. 10 schools in the Bronx, we're gonna, okay. We're gonna pilot it for this year, uh -huh. and then uh, next year roll it out to hopefully the entire school district. How old are these kids that are going to be using this? Uh, predominantly, it's going to be for high school students, okay. which is kind of full circle. You know, mm -hmm. we started teaching young adults about the importance of financial education. And so to come back, especially the Bronx, you know, we were both born and, and uh, raised outside the Bronx, but ended up teaching there. Um, so it's going to be a full circle moment, like I said, and we're excited. That sounds really exciting, and thank you for sharing it with us. Obviously, you want to get to kids uh, when they're young, like high school kids, before they uh, become adults and start spending their money rather than perhaps saving a portion of it. One of your challenges is getting people who are risk-averse to take that leap into investing. Is that easier or harder to do when you've got stocks and Bitcoin at or near record highs? Rashad? FOMO is, is a very real thing, and um, people want to you know, take tremendous risks when <laughs> stocks and Bitcoin is at an all-time high, but we encourage dollar cost averaging, right? You put small amounts of money in mm -hmm. consistently every week or every month. That helps people, especially if they have never invested. It's a lot easier to put $100 a week in as opposed to putting $10,000 or $50,000 and it's more responsible. So we encourage that way of investing and a lot of people are familiar with that with their 401ks. So it's <laughs> easier to kind of get them in that mold as opposed to just putting your life savings into one thing. But Troy, FOMO is a real thing, and yeah. it happens to inexperienced investors as well as really experienced investors. Institutional investors can't fall behind their benchmarks for too long before they have to, they're forced to make a move. Right. So how do you address this in a way that stays true to your mission, but also um, doesn't put them in a position to continue chasing things? Yeah, I think the education part is the most important thing, right? And so we try to teach people from the beginning stage about the importance of investing, right? We talked about dollar cost averaging, but we also talk about understanding what you're investing in, right? Yeah. We don't want people looking at charts and saying, okay, that's green, I need to go with it. We want to make sure that people have a fundamental understanding before they make any investment, right? We always say, before you get into anything, make sure you know how you're going to get out. Um, so having people start where they are and using what they have and having a, a, a fundamental base around investing in, in stocks and definitely Bitcoin is important. And so that's always what we stress, education first before you make any move. I, I am curious about one component of this literacy program, and that's the entrepreneurship side. So much when we talk about financial literacy, it is about investing or about managing your, you know, your personal finances, your credit, and things like that. But the entrepreneurship side of this, to me, seems relatively new. I certainly didn't get that when I was a kid. Uh, but I'm seeing a lot more of that show up in curriculums in high school and even uh, in grade schools. It's important. Yeah. When you think about entrepreneurship, our community is underrepresented. And that's really the driving engine of the American economy. It always has been, mm -hmm. uh, from large businesses to small mom and pop businesses. Mm -hmm. So you don't become an entrepreneur by accident. You actually have to learn entrepreneurs. A lot of people learn entrepreneurship on the fly like we did, but that's one of the reasons why it's such a low percentage of exceeding as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So if you actually had some level of education about entrepreneurship, then the chances of you actually being successful will probably go up. So we want to give kids an alternative. You know, there's nothing wrong with being an employee, right. but we need more business owners. We need more people that employ other people. So we want to teach them the fundamentals. And you two are kind of walking examples of that. I mean, you got to talk about your background as a teacher and building this business, uh, which is wildly successful. I was even told, Rajah, that you're actually going to be at the State of the Union address. Uh, tomorrow. But Troy, I mean, maybe you could address this idea because people aren't just looking to you for advice. They're also looking to you guys as an example. Yeah, I feel like it, this, yeah. this movement has been aspirational and yeah. inspirational at, at, at the same time. You know, like you said, we started as nine to five workers, um, but we realized very quickly that having one income is too close to none. 
and that seems to be a problem throughout our community. And so what better way to create more incomes than create a business? Mm -hmm. uh, if we look at the wealthiest people in the world, they've all created businesses and they have ownership inside of it. And so, you know, we've seen minor pop shops inside of our communities, and now it's time to figure out how do we scale, how do we create businesses that scale, and how do we create more wealth for not only our families uh, from a generational standpoint, but our communities as a whole. As for your own business, we've seen that in the corporate world, um, a lot of companies are actively moving away from putting resources into DEI programs and DEI efforts. I'm curious as to what that means for your work. Um, does it limit what kind of corporate partnerships you may have considered striking? It's, it, or, or. Oh, sorry. it's always an uphill battle as far as dealing with yeah. corporate um, for a variety of different reasons. And a lot of things, um, it's a thing called hidden racism, right? Where you have the numbers, you have the impact, but you still have to prove yourself over and over again where your, your counterparts that um, are different hue as you don't have those same hurdles. And that's hard to communicate with people that are not at the level that actually, you know, understand that. So. It's always been a challenge for us as far as working with corporate. We do have some great corporate partners, but we have always been self-reliant. We funded our business. We've never taken outside capital. So regardless of our relationships with corporate, we're still going to you know, move forward. But um, it is challenging. And it's something that I think should definitely be highlighted for sure. Yeah, I think that's one of the beautiful things about being an entrepreneur is that we can make our own rules, right? And so in order for those messages to get out about what's happening, we have the freelance to say it and speak about it and shed light to it. And as we climb, we're telling people the experiences that we're having so that there could be some change. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. Earn Your Leisure co-founders Rashad Bilal and Troy Millings uh, speaking with us today. We've got much more coming up on The Close because coming up, the rapid advance of AI means finding a way to keep it under control. Paula Goldman, the Chief Ethical and Humane Use Officer at Salesforce, will be joining us next. All right, with the recent and rapid acceleration in AI technology comes concern about fair use and control. Our next guest says that it's critical that we keep a human at the helm of AI. Paula Goldman is joining us right now. She's an executive vice president and the chief ethical and humane use officer at Salesforce, joining us today from the Trailblazer DX development conference out there in San Francisco. And Paula, I, I am curious about the discussion out there because you, we talk about this idea of, of having that human still be a part of this process, yet, I don't know, we've had a parade of folks on this program. They don't seem to be thinking about the humans at all here. Where's the balance? Well, you know, I think it's absolutely critical. And, and when you talk about it, it's a really exciting time for AI, but AI is moving really rapidly. We're moving from AI just generating content to actually taking action on our behalf. And that means that we need to have even more sophisticated controls to make sure it works well. So you've heard, you've heard probably this term, human in the loop, the idea that people are reviewing each and every single AI generated content. And we need to upgrade that. Like we need better controls. We need to make sure that people are at the driver's seat of AI, and that's what we're calling human at the helm. Is this something that you're just doing internally there at Salesforce for your own benefit, or is this something that you're also uh, pushing to clients, or maybe the clients themselves are asking yeah. for it? They're asking for it. Let me let me talk to you about that. So we've done. We're obviously always talking to our customers formally, informally. We did a study of uh, employees across our customer base. 80% of them, good news, they're saying AI is helping their work lives get better, more productive. They're liking the, what's going on with AI products right now. 60% of them, though, are saying we need human at the helm. We need better controls, right? So they're asking for it. The customers are asking for these types of controls. So I'm, I'm curious, which institutions or which industries um, should be or are best positioned to uh, lead the way to ensure that there's a human at the helm? Is it the public sector? Is it the tech sector? Is it, um, you know, the education sector? Yeah, I actually, honestly, I believe it's across the board, but obviously when you have uh, AI outcomes that are more risky, where we're talking about, you know, deciding who gets a job, who gets a loan, that's then the controls become even more important. But for example, we have a huge set of products for service workers, right? And we're talking about next generation controls for service use cases. So that, let's say you've got a contact center, 
you've got an audit trail and you know exactly every, not just one by one, the AI interactions, but you can look across them and you can see where did they go well and where might we need to fine tune the policy because we keep seeing people edit the AI output. It's that kind of stuff. What do the controls look like and how do we upgrade them? Okay, so when we talk about controls, uh, there's obviously going to be discussion about government regulations, some rules of the road, and there is the need to create some AI regulations and that has bipartisan support. But it's easy to see how Democrats and Republicans will end up squabbling over um, details and find some way to disagree. How are the lines drawn right now from where you sit in terms of what Democrats are pushing for, what Republicans are pushing for in terms of what we might get in the coming years? You know, it's interesting. I am really optimistic about where things are headed, because if you look at the series of uh, hearings and briefings in the Senate, if you look at the commission that was recently announced, as you said, it is bipartisan. And I think people are focusing on the right questions, right? So how, what are the sets of obligations and responsibilities across all of the layer cake for AI? So not just people that are creating models, but people that are creating apps, people that are using the apps. And then what are the transparency obligations to consumers? And those are the sets of things, questions that are being worked out right now, both uh, in Congress, but also with mm -hmm. volunteers efforts with the White House and whatnot. And, and I think those are exactly the right sets of questions. When do we start seeing a little bit more of that transparency, not just in the process, but in also the results? I'm sure, Paula, you've seen, at least on the, the chatbot side, uh, some somewhat, I guess, embarrassing uh, results that have come out of Claude and, and uh, some of the other programs as well. Uh, but it's not so much that it was wrong. It raised a lot of questions as to sort of what was put into that that led it to that. And no one, at least no one outside of those companies, seems to be able to provide an answer. Yeah, I mean, these are very hard questions. And it also, I think the, these recent news stories also show that, um, you know, customers need to be in control of their AI. Uh, the approach that we've taken at Salesforce on that question is to really put the controls in the hands of our customers, to give them choice so that they can tune up and tune down their brand voice. They can tune up and tune down how creative or not creative they want the AI to be. Mm -hmm. um, but again, here too, I think these are also questions where you do need government to step in and take take a lead, right? And that's why you want you want to be give, to give choice to customers, but you do also need a rules of the road from I government as well that everyone can abide by. Maybe we get that, but as you know how Washington works, it could be a long time coming before we get something concrete. In the meantime, though, everyone is left to their own devices, Paula. And I'm curious as to how much of a discussion is going on out there, Trailblazer, and really in Salesforce overall about the security aspect of this. We've heard from a lot of folks who've raised concerns here about using these models and the idea that you have to open up these models to make them effective, but that, of course, also opens you up to exploitation. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, if we talk to our customers, top of mind for them are security, data integrity, privacy. They know what's going on with their data. They know where it is or isn't going. They don't want it to be used to train third party models, that kind of stuff. The approach that we've taken here is also about what we call our trust layer, which is a set of protections around the integrity of their data and the security. And yes, we also have something that we call a prompt defense, right? Because people are bad actors, yes, are attacking these models and they're attacking AI systems. And those are that's an ever-changing threat vector. Mm -hmm. And it's very important that we keep up and protect against it. All right, Paul, I really appreciate you taking time for us on the sidelines uh, of that big event out there in San Francisco, Trailblazer DX. Paula Goldman, their Chief Humane Officer over at Salesforce. All right, uh, let's turn, Scarlett, to Nordstrom. I don't know if you were keeping an eye on this, but the shares dropped about 16% today, and that's a good reason to sort of look back in history and a lot of the efforts that department stores have made over the years to really try and invent themselves outside. Reinvent themselves. The public, yeah, reinvent themselves outside the glare of the yeah. public markets. Yeah. And that leads me to a question I have for you. What percentage of Nordstrom shares do you think is actually held by Family Insiders? Enough to resist a lot of change. <laughs> How about that? Well, we're going to find out the answer to that question and a look back on this day in history when we come back after the break. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, on this day, we take a look back at the legacy of grand department stores, grand retail ambitions, and the glare of public markets. It was on this day back in 2018 when Nordstrom shares opened sharply lower. This after investors had learned just hours before that the company's board had rejected a buyout offer from the founding family. 
a $50 a share bid that the board called inadequate. Nordstrom shares, they were trading around $40 at that time. They trade at under $20 today. That episode six years ago, combined with other take private efforts since, including at Kohl's, Macy's, Michael's, and Chico's, raises a lot of questions, an age-old question, if you will, about an aging industry. Given the massive changes in the way people shop, how does a legacy retail business craft a long-term plan for adapting when it's still subject to the short-termism of Wall Street? Case in point was back in 2017, when Nordstrom said it would experiment with a no-inventory store in West Hollywood, California, that would act as basically a small showroom. Investors slammed the idea and slammed the stock, pushing it down 3% the day of the announcement, and Nordstrom moved on. And this is exactly why a group representing the founding family in 2018 tried to take the company back, and this is exactly why they failed. At the time, the Nordstrom family held at least 15% of the shares outstanding, a number that has now since doubled, with more than 30% of the shares outstanding now held by insiders. In fact, there are only 10 other companies among the Russell 1000 that have a higher concentration of insider control, and that includes names like News Corp, Lennar, and Oracle. Now, the takeover speculation did lift Nordstrom stock over the next few months to as high as 67 bucks a share, but by mid-2019, the stock was below $30 and has never since reapproached that $50 offer price. There have been several overtures for the company since, enough so that the board actually adopted a poison pill in 2022 that would thwart any hostile takeover attempts. This was similar to a strategy used by Kohl's to fend off a multitude of activist investors. Arts and craft retailer Michaels also spent years keeping the barbarians at the gate, but finally succumbed, agreeing to a $3 billion deal with Apollo that closed in 2021. Sycamore Partners this year completed its $1 billion take private at Chico's, and now Macy's finds itself in the same spotlight, staring down funds like Ark House. And after Nordstrom's earnings last night and the big share drop today, it showed a lot of muted revenue growth for the next quarter and the year ahead, and maybe possible takeover chatter for the retailer will pick up once again. You know, you still you talk about that no inventory showroom. That is un-American. If you can't walk out of the store with your product in hand, that's a disservice to the customer. That's that's my take on it. All right, let's shift gears here because Fed Chair Jay Powell, of course, appeared before Congress today for his semi-annual Humphrey Hawkins testimony. And he reiterated to lawmakers that the central bank is in no rush to cut rates until the batter, battle over inflation was won. We believe that our policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle. If the economy evolves broadly as expected, it will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. The committee does not expect that it will be appropriate to reduce the target range until it has gained greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2%. Here with more insights into Powell's testimony is Anna Wong of Bloomberg Economics in Washington. Anna, good to see you. Um, Jay Powell has said consistently that the Fed needs more data, wants more data, not necessarily better data, just more data. But if inflation data does end up coming in hotter, like we saw with January CPI and PPI, won't that start morphing into wanting to see better data as well? Yeah, I, I thought the most interesting thing today is that Powell sounded more dovish than most of his colleagues that we have heard from in the past three weeks. So Powell said that the data he needs to see in the next couple of months is not necessarily better. In fact, it could be worse than the past six months, and still it's okay. And uh, you, you know why it is, is that um, um, even if uh, inflation data were to accelerate a little bit and uh, to be even hotter than what what we have seen in the past six months, um, 12 month change in core PCE is still likely going to hit 2.5 percent or below uh, by June. And today, Powell also said that he doesn't need to see the 12 month change in inflation to hit 2 percent before cutting. And that has been consistent with his message, which he has repeated four times before, that yeah. they can start cutting well before inflation hit 2%. These, this was a, there was a series of pointed questions. I can't remember the lawmaker specifically on that and how, he sort of, how the math sort of works uh, in favor of that narrative, Anna. I don't think anyone doubts that there is going to be a somewhat dovish tilt to this Fed this year. I think the doubt right now is whether we get three cuts or the four or five or whatever is priced into this market. And Powell didn't really articulate that. In fact, he seemed pretty intent in trying to avoid answering that question. Yeah, I, th I think um, you can basically uh, tell from his tone that he's somewhat more dovish than the other committee members. And he avoided that possibly because 
you know, he's not sure. Um, and he, even though the SEP right now says 75 basis point of cuts this year, if you go by the inertial Taylor rule, which is what the committee has stuck to in the past two years, it would have suggested 90 to 100 bips of rate cuts this year. So certainly I don't think they know even whether they're going to do 75 bips or more. All right. Well, Anna Wong over at Bloomberg Intelligence, uh, Bloomberg Economics, keeping an eye on this. And of course, we still have to wait to March 20th uh, for that Fed meeting. We did get a big central bank meeting earlier today out of the Bank of Canada. Rates left on change and we get a big one tomorrow. The European Central Bank holding its second policy meeting of the year. And most officials are urging patience on those expectations for rate cuts until they see more evidence that inflation is indeed slowing. Constantine Fight joining us right now, PIMCO's uh, portfolio manager and executive vice president. And Constantine, no, no one's really expecting a change tomorrow. But when it comes to the communication that we get out of Lagarde, do you think that she's willing to sort of give the market a little bit more hope that those rate cuts are indeed coming and coming sometime soon? Yeah, I don't think so. I think the message will probably be broadly similar to to what we've heard from her in the last meetings. They are data dependent. They need to gain more confidence. Uh, services inflation is still too high. So we would be very surprised if we get a little of forward guidance uh, from her tomorrow. So the Fed has a preferred inflation gauge, right? It likes to look at core PCE or the super core um, version as well. Does the ECB have a preferred inflation gauge that markets kind of hone in on and fixate on? Yeah, the ECB has a, a single mandate of 2% inflation over the medium term. So typically the staff forecast, and we will get new staff forecasts tomorrow, um, are obviously important. So we get numbers for 25 and 26 again. They will probably come in broadly at target, both on headline and on core inflation. But I think there is skepticism around services inflation. I mentioned it earlier. It's 4% roughly in the euro area, 5% in the US, and 65 still in the UK. So all the central banks are broadly in the same boat right now. They need to be confident that wages moderate, that that part of the inflation equation uh, comes down before cutting interest rates. Right. I like how you say that. All the central banks are kind of in the same boat right now. Does that mean, what's the likelihood that the ECB would move ahead of the Fed when it does decide to cut rates? Or does it need or want to wait for the Fed to do so first? So they're obviously looking at what the Fed is doing, but I don't think they will be kind of thinking about going earlier or later than the Fed. They, they will look at their um, um, euro area-wide inflation uh, projections. They will look at uh, core inflation developments in the euro area and policy transmission and make a decision based on that. They will probably not want to go far ahead uh, of the Fed, but I don't think that uh, there is a strong view uh, that they have to go mm -hmm. a little bit before, a little bit after the Fed. A lot of investors, uh, Constantine, seem like they're at least somewhat comfortable with where rates are right now at four and a half percent, although the expectation is they want to see that come down. I guess the question is, are, are the economic conditions across Europe and particularly in some of the key countries like Germany, are they actually going to be supportive of where rates are right now? Or is that economic data really going to uh, shift what Lagarde has to do? I think the ECB is not in the business of uh, avoiding a recession. They're in the business of uh, getting inflation down uh, to 2%. So that's what's guiding um, them. Um, obviously, you have a lot of dispersion within the euro area. Germany is reasonably weak uh, from an economic perspective right now. Um, so monetary policy transmission when it comes to the periphery, for example, is not a big issue right now. But overall, I think that's what the ECB is, is uh, focused on. And if you look at what has been priced in not too long ago, you had almost 175 uh, basis points of rate cuts priced for 2024. Um, that is uh, that has been very excessive before uh, now market pricing is more closer to four cuts for this year which we think is much more mm -hmm. more reasonable uh, what, what is your general outlook though for the broader european economy this year particularly relative to maybe what we're seeing here in the u.s which is still looking relatively strong yeah, so uh, last year Europe was broadly stagnating, the U.S. was very strong, and this is a theme that's broadly continuing this year as well. So the U.S. is growing probably above trend this year as well, while in Europe it looks like we will be growing uh, below trend. So it looks like we've troughed, uh, so economic momentum is turning, the PMIs are closer to 50 now, um, band landing surveys look a little bit better. So there are a lot of like green shots, if you want, uh, in Europe as well, but uh, that probably will mean still pretty weak growth in the euro at close to 1% at best for this year. You know, I'm looking at the European stock market up about 4% when you look at the stock 600. Euro, of course, at 108.97. What 
what's priced in when it comes to equities and the euro and what would trigger a, a move, a, a significant move uh, in terms of commentary from the ECB? I think what's priced in is a soft landing. And um, you see that in credit markets more broadly, in stock markets, also in the rates markets. Uh, so the market is pricing a soft landing. And I think the risk case would be if that's not uh, uh, materializing in a sense that uh, inflation doesn't come down. We don't get the cuts uh, uh, that people are expecting from the central bank. And this could be an environment that's less pleasant uh, uh, for, for risk assets. All right. Konstantin Veit of PIMCO, really appreciate your joining us today. And of course, stay with Bloomberg for our coverage of the ECB rate decision and the news conference from Christine Lagarde. That's tomorrow at 8.45 a.m. New York time. And of course, as we wrap up the day today, uh, it was quite the roller coaster ride, especially, Romain, if you were looking at uh, financials, the KRE, which is the ETF that tracks regional banks, yeah. down as much as 3 percent before rising as much as 1.7 percent, finishing little change. But that really doesn't show you the, the volatility in the names like NYCB. Yeah, and it's, it'll be interesting to kind of see what this means, right? I mean, if, if this company really was teetering and now they get this lifeline led by uh, Mnuchin's uh, Liberty Capital, mm -hmm. uh, is that it? Is that sort of the end of the story? And I also think it's interesting, too. I mean, we'll have to ask him specifically, but what do they see in those assets that yeah. they had the confidence to come in with a billion bucks in total uh, and, and effectively bail this company out? Clearly, they don't necessarily see as much dourness as maybe investors had seen leading up to today. Yeah, well, the bank gets a yeah. $1 billion lifeline from Steve Mnuchin's company and markets. Uh, end How much the did day, you give? <laughs> yeah. Less than $1 billion. How about that? <laughs> And uh, we did have stocks uh, finishing lower today. Uh, oh, excuse me, finishing higher today. I'm talking about bond yields, of course. Uh, they did move as well. And uh, we'll take a look at Bitcoin as well, finishing higher, but did not get to that $69,000 level that we matched yesterday. Okay. Are we still doing 69? We're still waiting for 69,000 okay. again. All right. This is a close on Bloomberg. Nikki Haley has suspended her campaign for president after losing primaries in every Super Tuesday state except one. That sets Donald Trump and Joe Biden up for a rematch for the White House this November. So let's bring in Bloomberg Balance of Power co-host Kelly Lines with more. Kelly, what's at stake now in the rest of the primaries? Well, effectively not much. It's just about locking up the exact number of delegates that Donald Trump and Joe Biden will respectively need to actually secure the nominations uh, of their parties. Donald Trump, of course, now has more than a thousand delegates uh, collected across the primary states we've seen thus far. He needs 1,215. So Super Tuesday didn't quite get him there, but he could very well have uh, those numbers in the bag by the end of March. And what this really sets up is an incredibly long general election contest. Eight months, the longest we have seen uh, in modern history. It is like to be expensive. It could very well uh, be very negative. And of course, it, it essentially has begun now. A big question surrounding the departure of Nikki Haley, who, by the way, did not endorse Donald Trump when she announced she was stepping out of the race, is where those who were voting for her in these primary states will go in November. It was a non-insignificant amount of voters, somewhere between 20 and 30 percent in a lot of these states, are they likely to vote for Trump instead of her? If that's the choice, are they likely to pivot over to Biden, vote third party, or could they just not show up at all in November? It's that group of voters that Trump and Biden are now going to be uh, vying for. Both Biden and Trump in statements today said Nikki Haley uh, supporters should come over to their camps to paraphrase their words. And that's going to be uh, where a lot yeah. of the fight is going forward. Well, that might be a hard sell. I mean, I was looking at some of those congressional races, yeah. Kelly. I mean, it is basically the far right Republicans that are winning these things. Of course, that was not her core uh, base at all. I do want to pivot, though, from right. Nikki Haley and, the, and Donald Trump and the Republicans to the, the Democratic side of this. The president of the United States still has the bully pulpit and he'll get to use it tomorrow in that State of the Union address. Is this going to be a de facto stump speech? 
Yeah, Romain, this is his biggest moment he might have in the election cycle to reach the widest audience possible. Aside from the speech at the congression, uh, convention in August, this is going to be a very big moment for him. And of course, there's likely to be a significant amount of policy in this speech to talk about the economy, the Bidenomics agenda he has undertaken, probably also address the issue of the border and call attention to the fact, as we have seen him do in recent weeks, that he agreed to a deal that congressional Republicans shot down. We're likely to hear him call on Congress uh, to continue supporting Ukraine as well. Some foreign policy will be making it into this speech is really this is going to be uh, a campaign speech just as much as it is as it is a state of the union. But for that reason, we have heard from a lot of people here in Washington that it's not so much about what the president says as it is how he says it. If mm. there is vitality uh, and strength shown in these remarks, considering there are really ongoing lingering concerns around the president's age. He is 81 years old, and as our own po polling here at Bloomberg, uh, together with Morning Consult, has found in key swing states that could decide the election, eight in 10 voters think Biden is too old for a second term. So presentation is going to be everything for him tonight. Yeah, Tomorrow. style over substance, perhaps. But when it does come to substance, Kaylee, um, what do the independent voters, what do Nikki Haley's supporters, for instance, who are now up for grabs, what are they most concerned about? And therefore, what is Biden likely to speak to them about? Well, in the exit polling we've seen in a lot of these Republican primary contests, immigration and the border issue and the economy are really vying for, for the top spot. So he is very likely to focus on those policy areas. But when we think about the messaging from the president here, if he wants to draw in these voters, what message can he use to do so without losing the left wing? He also has to cater to the progressive wing of his party, keep the coalition intact that elected him to the White House in 2020, while also trying to draw in those more uh, conservative voters. That is going to be a very tricky line to walk because, of course, he doesn't want to lose the Latino vote, for example, by being too hard on the border, but also does want to show strength in that area, knowing it is a political weakness for him. Polling suggests voters are very dis dissatisfied with his handling uh, of that issue. So it's going to be about trying to walk that line, keeping in mind that in a number of seats, including in Minnesota yesterday, there was a, a sizable chunk that voted uncommitted, 19 percent. And that, too, is a, a about his... Yeah support of Israel, given what's going on in Gaza. And that's something that this president has to think about as well as he speaks tomorrow. All right. Kelly Lyons down there in Washington. Be sure to check her and Joe Matthew out on Balance of Power. That's coming up at the top of the hour today. And tomorrow they will have full coverage of President Biden's State of the Union address with special coverage starting right here on Bloomberg at 830 p.m. Washington time. Meanwhile, back here in New York, we're going to set you up for what investors will be keeping their eye on over the next 24 hours. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. All right, welcome back. A couple of interesting earnings reports coming out tomorrow that might give us maybe a little bit more insight into inflation or and the, disinflation. And, and the consumer. Or in the consumer. Jennifer Bartash is joining us right now over at Bloomberg Intelligence. A closer look at Costco and Kroger set to report uh, tomorrow. And I guess the big question I think everyone really wants to know is that pricing power that we had seen in this space, is that gone? Yeah, the pricing power is definitely diminished. Um, when you look at someone like Kroger, they're a value player. So it is in their interest to bring prices down as quickly as possible as the costs that they incur come down. And so that, that causes a place where they've really enjoyed top line growth from inflation over the last few years. Now they're going to have to make up with it with unit growth um, and selling more volume of items. Uh, which could still be a challenge where the consumer is. Nevertheless, we've seen retailer reports that seem to suggest that the consumer is holding up pretty well in terms of demand. So what's the read through for Kroger, for Costco? Yeah, when you look through the read through um, for Kroger, it's really about are people adding more items to their baskets again? Um, and have they stopped the trade down to lower priced goods? So that's really the, the, the takeaway for Kroger. Um, people are still spending on essentials, so that's a good thing. When you turn, when you turn to someone like Costco, um, the consumer, we are starting to see some better results with some of the bigger ticket items. Um, and that's actually very good news for, for um, Costco. BJ's is also reporting um, that general merchandise, which is high, mar you know, high margin and high ticket items, mm -hmm. um, is something that they've been really missing lately. Is this a story when we look at Costco and for that matter Kroger as well? Is this a story about essentials, consumer essentials, consumer staples? Or is there a discretionary story in there as well, as you seem to be implying with Costco? 
Well, it, it has been a, a story about essentials for, for quite a while now. We're starting to see the beginning signs that discretionary is coming back. Um, we saw a little bit with Walmart where they talked about discretionary categories improving. Um, we're seeing some credit card data that suggests that Costco is seeing big ticket items come back. So we're at the very beginning, but there are some positive signs out there. For right. some people, big screen TVs are an essential. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, Jennifer Bartash, but you can only buy so many of those, Scarlett. Jennifer Bartash is over at Bloomberg Intelligence. Of course, we, we have full coverage of those earnings, but quite a, a few other things that we have to cover tomorrow as well, including the ECB and a big rate decision, 8.15 a.m. Eastern time. Yeah, and the central bank there is expected to keep rates unchanged at 4.5%. Of course, uh, they are a single mandate central bank looking only at inflation and inflation at 2%. We're going to hear from Christine Lagarde, arguably with the second most important central bank, and we're going to hear from from Jay Powell once again for day yeah. two of testimony on Capitol Hill. Yeah, this time it's in front of the Senate Finance Committee, so the tone will be a little bit different, but a, a range of topics to be brought up, I'm sure, but he will stick to his knitting and stick to his consistent message that the Fed is willing to be patient to wait, uh, but rate cuts are likely to happen sometime this year. A lot of questions about monetary policy, to be sure, probably about the economy as well, and the President of the United States. He's also going to have to address a lot of those issues, a State of the Union address scheduled for tomorrow night. Yeah, it's going to be really tricky. He has to cover a lot of ground and, of course, convince uh, any undecided voters or any reluctant voters that he's the one who's going to lead us through the next four years. His presentation will matter a lot. His presentation will matter a lot. Full coverage of that. Of course, we will also have coverage on Bloomberg Radio of the latest PGA Tour tournament, the Arnold Palmer Invitation kicking off in Florida. And we do get some more earnings uh, before and after the bell. We were just talking about Costco and Kroger. We get a couple tech companies as well. In yeah, Marvell Technology will be reporting, so we bring you those ner numbers when they cross. DocuSign as well. I'm paying attention to Gap because that's a company that's been in turnaround mode for a while. Absolutely here. Stick with us and we will have full coverage of all of that stuff tomorrow. In the meantime, our political coverage continues after the break with Balance of Power right here on Bloomberg.